Good afternoon, um, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, for our fifth Walker and Dunlop Wednesday webcast. Uh, it's great to have um, everyone with us this morning um, and this afternoon on the East Coast. Um, Mary Erdos is joining me this morning uh, for our call, uh, but she got caught on a uh, New York Fed uh, discussion, and she will be joining us as soon as she comes across, and I think I just saw her show up on my screen. So okay, let, me, let, me, uh, let me start with um, a quick overview of a couple things in the commercial real estate space. Um, I'm going to make it much quicker than in the past because I want to spend as much time with Mary as possible, um, given a the number of people who pre-registered to join us this morning. It's obvious that many, many people want to hear from Mary. And the second thing is that um, the questions that I've gotten uh, run all over the all over the block, if you will, and so I'm very much looking forward to diving into that with Mary. Uh, on the commercial real estate side, uh, real quick, uh, last week, right after this call, the National Multifamily Housing Council came out with um, a report on rent payments through the first five days of April, um, which um, was a premature calculation on rental payments in the United States for the first uh, part of April, and many, many headlines across the country ran articles uh, saying that rent payments were down dramatically for the month of April. As many of you may have seen, NMHC updated their numbers this morning, um, and uh, the rent rolls have improved dramatically um, from the report that NMHC put out last week. Um, from what we have been seeing across the market, um, rent rolls have been collected at somewhere between 92 and 95%. Uh, month to date, uh, which significantly better uh, than the number that NMHC put out last week, which was 69%. Um, the NMHC numbers have moved on across the country up into the um, high 80s um, across the board. And uh, I am hopeful that many of the publications that ran stories last week talking about a significant degradation to rent payments across the country will come back out and update their stories and the numbers there. Um, as I mentioned last week, the forbearance requests that we had gotten in the Walker and Dunlop multifamily portfolio um, had been very few, and um, I'm pleased to say a week later um, that is still the case. Um, and so what we're seeing in the multifamily space is a, is a holding up of rent rolls and of people paying their rent, uh, and then also um, the great majority of owner operators um, continuing to pay their mortgages and not having to file for forbearance. Uh, Prior to this call, I also got a lot of questions as it relates to retail and other asset classes. Um, the one thing that I would say as it relates to retail that is somewhat um, counterintuitive is that in past cycles, everyone has wanted to have credit tenants in their malls. Um, they've wanted to have the big box retailers who have big balance sheets and, and, and broad operations, and that weakness in the last financial crisis really came from the smaller operators. Um, there was an article this morning on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and I have heard plenty of instances uh, where it's actually the big boxes, it's the big retailers who are actually not paying right now, um, and it's the smaller local operators who are still paying. Um, seems counterintuitive, except for the fact that the big box retailers are getting hit in every single market, uh, and the smaller operators, um, A, hopefully have enough uh, capital to withstand um, this step back, and B, they want to make sure they have their space when things open back up. Um, so a little bit counterintuitive there on retail. Um, on the hospitality side, um, we did have a, a client of Walker and Dunlop's who had a very large hotel in Manhattan, uh, which was, uh, they were about to throw the keys back to the Mez lender. Um, it was vacant, and it's a very, very large property. Um, they got a call from FEMA last week saying they needed to house um, the medical workers uh, who are on the ship that is in New York Harbor, and they have master leased that hotel to take all of the medical workers off the ship at night and have them be able to stay somewhere. Um, that's great news for the owner of the hotel. Um, the one thing I would put forth is with the rate that FEMA is paying them and their costs of running the hotel, they're still only covering about a quarter of their debt service. And so if you think about them being one of the lucky ones of actually getting some revenue right now in a hotel, um, they're still in a pretty deep hole uh, given the economics of their property. So um, I won't go through spreads this week and a number of the other things that I've talked about in past weeks, but plenty of liquidity in the market on the multifamily side, very, very selective lending across other asset classes, um, and we are now into earnings season, which is actually a good segue into starting my conversation with Mary. 
Um, the first out yesterday was J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and um, I think the most uh, noteworthy piece to their earnings release was the $6.8 billion provision they took for loan losses, which I think set the market up to think that there are um, there's some real pain in the lending markets coming up. So um, I want to bring Mary in. Mary is CEO uh, of the Asset Management and Wealth Management Businesses at J.P. Morgan. Um, Mary manages a, a, a team of about 25,000 employees around the globe, um, and they have under management somewhere between 2.5 and $3 trillion. Um, that's with a T, not a B. Um, and the size and scale of Mary's operations at uh, J.P. Morgan, quite honestly, every time I talk to her, it's hard for me to get my head around how big an operation she runs. Um, and so first of all, Mary, thank you very much for joining um, us today to talk about the markets and what you're seeing. Um, I want to start by um, kind of rolling the clock back a little bit, maybe a year, where a year ago, April of 2019, the markets were performing exceedingly well. Um, I would say, generally speaking, everyone was in a risk-on mode, and you wear two hats at J.P. Morgan, one running the asset and wealth management business, and two, um, sitting on J.P. Morgan's operating committee. Um, if you think back a year, how much of a typical day was dealing with um, your business versus operating committee issues, and then where are you today as it relates to the, the, the time uh, that you're spending on your own business versus broader operating committee issues of risk and liquidity and things of that nature? So, Willie, hopefully you can see me and hear me. I can. Okay, great. So thank you. Um, I'm so honored to be uh, part of this, and I thank you for having me uh, in this dialogue with you. And more importantly, thank you for everything that you and your company uh, do when you trust J.P. Morgan to help you uh, as you go through all the great things that you do for so many people across the country. And uh, I wanted to hear the spreads and stuff, so maybe we'll do that after <laughs> the next call. But it's, um, well, it's been quite a wild ride. Um, the good news is that this is not the first financial crisis or crisis uh, that we've been through. So at J.P. Morgan, as you know, uh, we've been around for 200 years, so the firm itself has been through many. Um, but the management team at, that is currently in charge, this is the, you know, really the playbook from the great financial crisis was the easy part of getting us through what was happening in the markets um, and trying to think through each of us managing our own businesses, but then coming together to, to figure out the firm. And those look, that looked like you know, some of the early days in terms of market volatility. But then what we added to the playbook of how to run the firm from the great financial crisis was really a, a playbook that no one has, uh, which is how do you take an entire operation and get it to work from home? How do you think about legal compliance? Uh, we have a quarter of a million people in our firm. We're well over 90% um, of employees working from home dealing with customer complaints, um, dealing with still getting cash into the branches, uh, dealing with financing of clients. And then we have just most recently added to that the PPP program of trying to get uh, cash into the hands of small businesses so that they can continue to function. All the while, uh, the management team doing that from home uh, and the rest of the employees uh, as well. So I think um, if you ask me how much is spent on my business versus the, the sort of firm at large, it's hard to, to pull apart the two. Um, but we have a regular cadence where the operating committee of the firm comes together every single morning and we close the day together uh, with a five o'clock roundup. And that's, um, that's something that we put into place right away and then uh, the only good news is we de decreased our twice on the weekends meeting to just once on the weekends. So if I, a little bit nicer. Yeah, you mentioned the great financial crisis and sort of if, to some degree this isn't the first time, but obviously with the differences that you just outlined. Uh, I remember um, our mutual friend Kevin Warsh said to me back in, um, I think it was Q4 of 2008, uh, as he was sitting um, uh, at the Fed saying that, you know, they were looking into the abyss and they didn't really know how far down it went and that every day he would come up with some new plan that they kind of threw at the wall and, and he and Chairman Bernanke would sit there and say, all right, let's see what we can do there. How, how much, since you were speaking back in 2008, 2009, how much does this feel eerily similar to the GFC? 
versus nope, this is a it's a shorter time frame. We kind of can see the end now, even though it's got some real bumps between here and there. Give me a sense of as you sit around on the operating committee talking about risk yeah. and liquidity versus back in eight and nine. Yeah, so it's such a good question, and it ties into um, some of the conversations we've been having with some of the other leaders in the asset management industry. But just just take the first sort of couple, the, the first couple of days of this crisis. Had it not been for all the people in 2008 who had to spend all that time thinking through which programs would work in which way, how would TALF work, how would, and, and the negotiations with the government, we reeled off the CPFF, the MDCF, the MMLF, the, the PMCCF, the SMCCF, TALF, and MLF all within one week. Just think about that. That would be an impossibility to do had we not had the playbook from 2008. So that has worked. It has short up the markets. The, the first part of the markets that always go first are the uh, short-term commercial paper markets. Those were uh, tidied up in pretty short order. Then you move to the short-term credit markets. Then you've been able to help some of the fallen angels. Ford is the quintessential sort of marker for that, having been downgraded and still being treated like an investment-grade credit, and on and on. And so there'll still be pressures in the high-yield market. There'll still be pressures with bankruptcies that are going to be upcoming. But you have a, a functioning credit market, and you obviously have a very healthy equity market that thinks that this is a very short-lived um, V-shaped recovery. This is really what it's pricing in. So the question at hand is, what is that? And if any, I don't, I haven't met anybody who has that answer because there is no playbook for this. There is nobody that understands when there's going to be a vaccine. There is nobody that totally understands um, whether the serology tests will be available, functioning, and that you won't have repeat virus issues so that we can figure out how to do tracing and we can operate in the developed world the same way that we develop in other parts of it. Just think about what China does, right? You are fully traced at every moment. You go onto a subway through a, a thermometer scan, every single subway stop. You get a QR code for the, for the train car that you're on, on the train. And then whenever we find that somebody might be sick, we will then send you a notice because we'll know where you were and then you will be in quarantine for the time period after. Like that's not how the rest of the, of the globe functions. And so there isn't even a playbook we can take from China and say, how is this gonna work and how is it going forward? So you can't bet against modern medicine figuring this out. The question is the time gap. How long is that time gap and how many issues do we have of repeat? How many businesses can't survive for long periods of time? How many jobs will be permanently displaced? How many people will not pay their mortgage? For how long? What happens to the people in the middle that are stuck between the government saying you don't have to do that and people not being able to uh, keep the operations going? So this is, this is an unknown for everybody having just come off the call that I was on with um, it, it's a, an investment advisors uh, call where we don't we can't talk about the specifics of what we discussed uh, at the meeting but I will tell you that it's not talking about spreads of bonds and vol and VIX and those kind of things it's talking about permanent damage to an economy what unemployment could look like um, how much more we separate the inequalities that already exist uh, in a society like the United States, uh, and then whether or not you can get some kind of correct, uh, corrective measures before you get social unrest and people that just aren't going to want to stay following the rules that are in place right now. So on that, um, so on the advisory board of the New York Fed, which you sit in the meeting that you just came from, um, I guess a, a question um, related to your outlook and then what you're providing to them. I guess first, how much outside input is the New York Fed looking for at this time? And, and so was that call really interactive or is it sort of them telling you how they're looking at it? And then I guess the other part to that question is that in your earnings yesterday, um, Jamie mentioned that the your 
outlook right now is a pretty you know good recovery in the back half of the year so JP Morgan is seeing if you will some light in the back six months of the year how you know kind of what kind of conviction is there around that because obviously everyone's trying to kind of model out and you guys have I mean, you bank half the United States population as it relates to yeah. those people in the banking system so you guys have a really good view into the finances of the average American and what people are doing. Mm -hmm. So A, how much are they listening to you? And B, how much conviction is That's there a lot of questions. for JP That's Morgan great. on the back half of the year? So let's answer the, the first one uh, is maybe easier. The After 2008, the Fed put together um, a number of groups to come together and get closer to what's happening, uh, either with market functioning and technicalities, all the way through to to forward-looking uh, issues. And so we meet every couple of months. Today was a, um, a very important meeting where people came together. But after 2008, it was really about them having a function to listen. And after the taper tantrum, it was really a mechanism for them to say, maybe we didn't totally understand how the market's going to, we're going to react. And that was the biggest crisis at the time. And so we got much more active. And today was, uh, uh, was exactly that. So um, all of the great members that are on that committee, which are the leaders of most of the largest asset management companies uh, in the country, both on the uh, mutual fund side as well as in the private equity and real estate space, talking about everything from the, the functioning of the emerging markets to bond markets in the future and negative rates um, to energy to, you know, the Fed already having put 2.2 trillion in probably is going to, you know, be ready to put whatever it takes to keep to keep going. So um, they're listening. Uh, we're also giving them feedback on the programs that have worked that they put in place that have been very helpful. So it was a, it was a really great dialogue. And I think it's a very important part of bringing um, government and business together, especially in times like this. Um, when we shift to our business at J.P. Morgan Chase, it's just like you, Willie, and how you run your company or, all, you know, many of your clients who are listening today. You, you have to have two, like, totally different bipolar mindsets. One is the, how am I going to run my company? Should think, you have to plan for the worst, right? You always have to prepare for the worst. So you're constantly running the company with, like, what if it gets super bad? What if it's not a V-shaped recovery? What if it's a very long prolong? How do I run the company? How do I keep um, employees, communities, shareholders, all of that in balance? What do I need to do differently? What things do I need to cut? How do I deal with vendors? How do I deal with um, uh, location strategies? How do I deal with being global and having different parts of the world open at different rates than other parts of the world? What can I learn? What can I not? And and so we all have that mentality of running our company, and then we have the investment mindset. And you have to be very hard and cold about the company stuff versus how you're managing the money. And so when you think about how clients are managing money, you, you, you don't bet against the U.S. stock market. Uh, it's the greatest form of capitalism in the world. It's where the most entrepreneurial businesses exist in the world. And we will rebound and we will come back. Now, the stock market seems to already have that uh, as if we are, you know, we're at that place and it's not inconceivable that we don't get back as fast as possible. Um, but getting portfolios in line for that is very different than making sure that your company. So, yes, our economic forecast is that, but we have loan loss reserves that we put up to make sure that we have a balance sheet. We always want to be a uh, fortress balance sheet in good times and in bad, and we want to uh, zig when the world is zagging and so that's what you're seeing us do so that we can continue to lend to small businesses to consumers to large companies to continue to function uh, and you're seeing most of that work really well so if you just if we go back a month then because I think you're putting all this into perspective and and trying to take into account how quickly things are moving um, Glenn Hutchins was on CNBC this morning talking about the fact that um, the objective was to flatten the curve and we have flattened the curve and yeah. sort of saying let's you know let's take the let's take the wins that we're seeing 
Um, yeah. We're not out of this in any way, but let's also realize that, you know, a month ago, the challenge was to flatten the curve and we have actually flattened the curve. Um, as, as you're getting on those operating calls every day, does the, is the, my, my sense right now is that everyone this week, after last week of somewhat of euphoria of it looks like we're going to flatten this curve and we're going to get on at least controlling the outbreak of this virus and the markets obviously rallied significantly. This week, mm -hmm. everyone's kind of waking up and saying, oh, well, now what next? So as if you, if you can help me a little bit thinking about how you all both to the point of, we got to look at the downside, which mm -hmm. most people are focused potentially too much time on right now, versus mm -hmm. when do we start to look for opportunities in the market to put money to work, et cetera, et cetera. How, you know, you've got the two sides that you've got to manage. One is yep. clearly on your operating committee calls, I'm assuming it's all mostly downside protection. And yet at the same time, you manage 2.5 to $3 trillion for your clients where you've got money managers across the globe saying, okay, we ought to be putting it here. We ought to be putting it there. How do you kind of bifurcate those yeah. two views? You have to take a long walk uh, <laughs> in between meetings. Well, Amy, it's, it's, if you're a student of history, you look back at all of the all of the times where we've had uh, wars and civil unrest and and uh, invasions, and none of them, none of them, except for uh, the oil crisis in the '70s, w were fundamentally market changing. Each one of them, if you had the foresight to ride through, you would you would ride through them. So you, again, you have to separate out that brain, and that's exactly what the stock market is doing right now. It could be right or wrong, but it will eventually be right. And uh, you know whether it's uh, whether it's overly um, exuberant at this current moment, which I think uh, we might be seeing some signs of. Uh, it will. It, it's generally in the direction of the markets will continue to find new highs uh, as we go through time. Mark things will adjust. There will be winners and losers, um, and we will continue to invest in the U.S. economy. So that's. That's what people should do and what people should continue to focus on. But, but right now, I think the world is trying to think about, like, I don't understand. How do I think about sports? How do I think about, you know, is football coming back? What does that mean? Like, how do, how do college football is a very big, you know, topic of conversation right now. And how does that play itself out? And, and the more you think through all of those things, you realize like the entire country has to figure out how to get it back together because you can't have just pieces of this working and other pieces not. Um, but if you focus on things like what the Business Roundtable are doing, you know, they have plan A, B, C for, for getting people back to work. I think you're going to see the U.S. government pushing hard uh, to be able to get some sense of normalcy. And that's going to have to coincide with serology testing and other things to try and figure out, like, how do we take the healthy people, get them back in the system, get things functioning, um, and still be able to protect those who are more, more, more vulnerable. But as Glenn did say this morning, uh, we should celebrate the wins of flattening the curve. We're going to have fits and starts. There's rumors of, you know, the virus can come back. You can get it a second time. Uh, it's much longer for a vaccine. We don't, we don't know, the, none of those are knowable truths, but there's some very hopeful things um, in the pipes with some of these pharmaceutical companies uh, that could come on, and you just can't bet against that. So let's turn to China for a moment. You touched on it earlier uh, briefly as it relates to, if you will, some of the, um, some of the things they put into place as it relates to controlling their population that um, are probably far-fetched for us to think about in the U.S., um, but you sit on the U.S.-China Business Council and know a lot about China, and J.P. Morgan has a huge business in China. Last week when I made some comments during the webcast about data that was coming out of China, I got a lot of people coming in and saying, can you trust that, can you trust that, can you trust that? So um, I know that you know, your business is run by Howard Wang over in China, and, and some of the notes that um, I picked up in a, in a recent call were that the supply chain looks much improved, um, a lot of companies have brought people back into company dormitories so that they can get back up mm -hmm. and going. The auto industry is operating now in China at about 80% capacity. Um, KFC is back at 90% in terms of new store openings. Malls at about 50% with increased daily traffic. Restaurants about 70%. Um, airlines, 40% capacity, but international is nothing. It's 5%. And then the one major caveat that came out of the notes that I saw was 
that you know Beijing is still on lockdown and anyone coming in and out of the city must go through a designated airport and also must quarantine themselves for two weeks. Taking out for a moment, Mary, the, the very real, if you will, um, societal controls that China has over their population that everyone says you can't really use it as a model for the U.S. Clearly these numbers out of your business and what you all are seeing um, give some people a playbook as it relates to once we control the virus and get quote unquote back to the new normal, this is kind of what a rebound would look like. Any yeah. thoughts as it relates to that data and, and how much we ought to look into that or just it's so different from the way that they're de they dealt with the virus that you really can't look at the economic data as a, a roadmap? It is, um, it, it's not data that is the same way that we look at our data, that we don't have, they don't have regulations on the way that they report things. Capacity utilization is a very different uh, concept. So to say that the malls are, you know, 50% of where they were doesn't mean that people are shopping at 50% of the rate. It means that the traffic walking through the malls, because it's a place to go, out and you can see the pictures of the people walking through the mall. That's okay. At least it's a sign of people getting out of their house and getting back to back to some semblance of life, which is the first step, and then getting back to having the the economy fully function. And so we now have a call every morning with the China team, um, and we have the analysts show us different pictures of restaurants and things, and we go through some of those stats. And like, yes, the airlines are back, but I'm not sure that the seats are taken in each of the planes that are flying. Like, you know, so you, you would want to drill, you, if you were all of us who are analysts at heart, you would want to drill down on that information and make it look like the other information that you're relying on. You can't do that. You can just take it as a symbol or a sign of sort of where it was and where it's headed to. Um, and they do have the ability to put people in dorms for two weeks and then quarantine them and make, have them all go back. And, like, wouldn't that be great if we actually could do that? Because you could get entire industries back up and functioning, but that's not the way that 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 we work. Um, but I am very hopeful at, at a lot of those, uh, at, at a lot of the signs that we see. And then, you know, you can extrapolate that to some of the bigger cities also, uh, like Hong Kong and Singapore, where we have people coming back into our offices running the AB playbook. Um, but I just think the way that we all work is also going to be very different. I, I don't think everyone's going to want to go sit on a trading floor the same way that you wanted to sit on a trading floor before. So now maybe you weave in the ability to do certain jobs from home and that real estate, maybe you need the same amount of space, but you have much less densification of that space. And, and so there's all sorts of things that need to be thought about and the companies that are thinking through that now as opposed to sort of sitting there in shell shock and not figuring it out and, you know, sort of waiting for someone else to figure it out are the ones that are going to be behind. So we're, we're, we're working through all that stuff, um, as I know you and your company are, and I think, I think those are the companies that are going to be the end game winners. And we're going to come out of this. It's, it's, it's going to be fine. The question is the time gap between where we are today and like little steps of normalcy. We don't need to jump back to total normalcy. We need to work our way into little steps of normalcy. Do you think that the U.S.-China relationship that was um, quite frosty leading into this, um, after we're through this, um, either get somehow mended because the trade war was suspended by this crisis and uh, we're working in collaboration as it relates to how to fight it, or do you think we kind of snap right back to where we were ahead of time as it relates to the um, sort of frosty relationship on trade and other issues? Yeah, I, I mean, it. it's going to be hard uh, because for sure there's already blame game issues going every which way around the world, not, not just U.S., China. So I think that there's, uh, there's we're going to have to work ourselves through that. Um, and then you're just going to have to work yourself through, like, a Zoom meeting is not the same as a as an in-person meeting. A lot of how we pulled ourselves together as countries coming together was a lot of in-person uh, cross-travel from one country to another to try and figure out how we're going to mend fences. And um, uh, when you listen to Dr. Kissinger and others talk about how that's going to have to happen, I, it... We're, we're going to need some time uh, for that. So, and countries will be more 
isolationist for a while. You, we may not open travel airways in the same way that we did in a very quick time period, as I think co countries are gonna are gonna want to fix themselves first. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about you, but I have to tell you, I am. I'm already just both uh, <laughs> tired and also physically tired from Zoom meetings. I get up in the morning at you know, and I get on Zoom calls at eight o'clock in the morning, and I get done at six o'clock at night. And whether I haven't gotten out of my seat or not, I'm just physically exhausted from the pace of this world where it's sort of there's no break there's no moving from one meeting to the next there's no traveling from one office building to the next and it's just it just saps my energy i don't know i don't know i mean i can only imagine it, your schedule you know it's, a, it, it's like such an important topic because it, they are the most intense days any any of us have ever had J just work alone forget about the the interaction that you have with your family in tight quarters and trying to figure out who does what and whatever nerves you were already on each other they're just heightened uh, as you go through time but an an eight hour day if you were lucky enough to get it is the equivalent of a 12 hour day you know a month ago because the 12 hour day a month ago had you know walking to the cafeteria go get lunch every meeting had sort of at least five or ten minutes in between it that you did sort of nonsense stuff or you walked around you, that doesn't exist anymore and if you don't force yourself to have some boundaries around how your life is going to function like this is just going to get super miserable because no one's going back to work as normal next week Right? And nerves are going to continue to increase. And we have this saying at JP Morgan uh, that, you know, everyone thinks that their job is so important and they come home and they're like, why are you bothering me? My work is like really important. I can't believe that you're coming in in the middle of this meeting with me and Willie Walker. Like, this is like so important. And what we don't realize is we just invaded on them. It's completely the opposite. And until you get your head around the fact that like you have invaded on a on a on a function of a house and you've brought your entire company into that, you gotta get through that mentally. And then you gotta figure out what are the rules of the road and you gotta figure out how to have fun and you gotta figure out how to make new habits and keep your health, whether that's meditation, physical exercise, like whatever it is, but you have to put the boundaries around yourself and you have to like take a physical cloth and put it over all the computers at some part during the day and like step away from the car and 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 leave because if you don't the mental health uh, issues are are really damaging and uh, and we all need to we, we spend a lot of time with our employee assistance programs doing that but if you don't work at a company that has those kind of things you know getting on some of these apps that are really helpful and just like investing the time to listen to the podcast to listen to the how to do even five ten minutes worth of meditation it can it, it can really help ground things on that mary uh there's a little out of sequence of kind of where i wanted things to flow but i think this is such an important topic that i just want to dive into it for two seconds um kind of back to the frame that i was talking about of the first three weeks for sort of crisis management uh, get everyone distributed out into homework, all the challenges that that created, and then also kind of just total inbound. And then last week was this sort of, oh, well, we actually are flattening the curve and markets reacted and everyone was sort of like, this feels a lot better than the last three weeks. And now we're in yeah. that sort of what next mode. Have, have, you, have you done anything with your team? Because, I mean, you've got such a a, 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 you know, your team is global. There are 25,000 people in it, much less the other, you know, quarter of a million people who are in J.P. Morgan uh, in, in all. Um, mm -hmm. As it relates to sort of shifting behavior, shifting schedules, shifting requests as we move into this sort of longer period, have you have you all put anything in place to your point of like putting a putting a, a cover over the, the computer yeah. monitor or what have you, have you started to move into really changing from that kind of crisis management mode into more of, okay, let's settle into this and what's the real change we're going to make to make this enduring, if you will? Yes. I, I would, so two things come to mind when you ask me that question. First is something probably everybody that's, that's, uh, that's on this call has done, like trying to, First, starting your days together and ending your days together are really good ways to put sort of boundaries around that. So we we start our day every day with a global morning meeting, which in some places in the world is nighttime. And we do not have that on Fridays for Asia's 
sake. And, and I think, by the way, that's something that we've been trying to do for years at J.P. Morgan, which is, hey, could you not have a Friday morning meeting? for anybody globally because you're eating into someone's Friday night. Well, now that everyone is living in a uh, in an interface computer world, they're now taking it seriously. They get it. They get what that feels like. And so maybe that's like those are some of the good permanent changes you can make in your company. But ending your day together also, having like a finite way, because there's a lot of people on your teams, however you're working, that they don't know what to do. They may be feeling lonely. They may not, they may be new to your company. So they're not like in the regular flow. They don't know the person that they can just call and have a casual conversation or get some help. And so constantly having bookends of checking in and then also finding the time in some of those meetings to have the virtual, you know, cocktail or the wear your famous, your favorite sporting gear or show your pets or, you know, all those fun things. Uh, we try and, and, and infuse that. Uh, and we do a lot of that. The other thing that I've been trying to do is just drop in on Zoom meetings, which I think is also, just think about the number of people you can see and interface with that otherwise you would have had to, you know, fly to the Philippines for that meeting and, and fly uh, to Madrid for this meeting and it takes up, you know, a day or two of your life, whereas you can be present in the whole hour-long meeting and then you go to the next hour-long meeting. So I actually think it brings big companies together um, in, in, in a sort of really special way. And you also, again, you get to see their home and you get to see a little bit about uh, their own cultures, where they're living, uh, et cetera. And I think people are getting a little bit more comfortable in like letting their guard down. And if the dog jumps up on the lap, it's okay. And it's not, because again, it was a little bit of that, you know, at least at JP Morgan, like, well, we're supposed to be perfect. And like, you people are all bothering me. Don't make any noise. This has got to be J.P. Morgan just moved inside of our house, and it's not. Like, no one in the world has that. So let's all just be real and be human and uh, and get to know each other on, on, a, on a very different level. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me turn to um, some research from JPM that Michael Semblis put out and just get your thoughts on it for a moment. Um, first of all, Michael's research is so incredibly insightful and, and uh, just powerful. Uh, but th this week he put out a, a number of graphs. The, the first were on sort of COVID-19 and the, um, the, the, the looking at world numbers of countries that are getting hit hard, others that aren't, the death, the mortality rate, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I don't want to get too much into the, the, the actual data there, but more on sort of um, the, the thing that I took from the data was, first of all, don't be too quick to draw conclusions that one country has dealt with this perfectly and another one hasn't dealt with it that perfectly because invariably these numbers and charts are sort of zigging and zagging all over the place and right as you think that one country has done a great job with it they get a spike and then when you think somebody else hasn't done a great job with it they all of a sudden start to turn down and then yeah. the other one that i thought was really really insightful was not kind of worrying about a v-shaped recovery or a u-shaped recovery but much more on the lag effect of GDP following the crisis and following when markets start to recover. Can you talk about your takeaway from the data you're seeing from Michael, A, as it relates to the virus, and B, what really should we be thinking about as it relates to the recovery um, uh, and using his framework of not so much is it a V or a U, but more of just keep in mind this lag effect of GDP behind crises? Yeah. So. Uh, Michael and I have been working together for 23 years, and he's one of the smartest minds uh, I've ever met. I'm super fortunate uh, to be able to uh, learn from him every day. On COVID-19, uh, Jamie and the operating committee have asked him to be the expert for the firm, and so he puts out this information on a real-time basis. It's on the J.P. Morgan homepage if anybody uh, wants it, and it's not, it's not there to make a better prediction than someone else. It's that he is spending 150% of his time talking to medical professionals uh, all around the world and thinking about uh, all of the things that he learns and then combining that uh, with a lot of the great coding work and big data analytics that we have as a firm as JP Morgan and applying that to things like this. And so what you quickly learn is that almost every model that was used within the first couple weeks was way overly basic, took little bits of information, extrapolated them out, uh, combined two or three variables, and then made these predictions that every single one of them has been wrong thus far. 
Um, and so when you don't have a data set of anything in the past, obviously things are, are hard to predict in the future, but he's begun to unpack that and is trying to have a better sense of how to make some predictions going forward, knowing that both the numerators and the denominators of every stat that you're reading around the world are incorrect. Right? So people are dying not in hospitals and it may not be recorded. People are dying of other things that maybe they just never even got tested for COVID or they were going to die anyway and maybe overly counted one way or another. And then of course the denominator is really the thing that we don't know and hopefully it's a much bigger number which would cause a greater set of the population around the world to have um, to have the immunity to the disease as, as, as we go forward. So he's spending a lot of time on that work and what um, people who haven't worked with Michael for 23 years wouldn't know is he's generally pretty sour on a lot of this stuff and he is much more on the hopeful side of what you're hearing all the different uh, people who think about how the economy is going to rebound. So I would just tell you that that's where he is on that, knowing we could all be wrong and that the Santa Fe tests that look like the work that they're doing on moths could be very helpful, like that could fail. And then we're, and then we're you know, back at stage one, at least with that company, uh, on vaccines, or it could not. So we're always monitoring and adjusting those, um, but the, the world will rebound. Lots of things will be pent up demand and other things will just be never be repeated. So we will have a big chunk of lost GDP uh, we will have a big chunk of things we are just not going to do the same in the future. We are not going to do a lot of things in the future, and that hasn't even at all been calibrated. Like lots of the big asset management firms have the war rooms that are all the smart analysts are in the room thinking about like which parts of the economy were never going to come back, which things are going to change forever. But like they're the same as you and me. We're all living this life brand new. We don't really know. It's hard to extrapolate out, um, and only time will tell. So I think each and every day, it's just about making sure that people have the wherewithal to live a life that's comfortable, they have short up enough, um, short up enough asset liquidity, make sure their portfolios are in balance, and know that they can weather the storm, but then have enough dry powder that should markets present themselves with some pretty interesting things that they could take advantage of it. And so you can get a very strong rebound of GDP uh, in the back half of 2020 or the beginning of 2021. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's what the whole full base case is. So you've been pretty outspoken pre-crisis about the proliferation or huge growth in the, um, in the triple B debt market. So the lowest rung of investment grade, where I believe the number that I heard you state in a previous interview was that it's grown from 1.5 trillion a couple years ago to 4.5 trillion pre-crisis. Yeah. Um, and you talked at the beginning about Ford being downgraded yesterday or day before yesterday when they um, uh, uh, came out with um, a statement about their balance sheet and having $30 billion of cash on hand. As you think about the recovery, is, is either the lowest rung of investment grade or junk debt something that's a big concern that could actually trip us up as we come out of this? Absolutely. There's no, I mean, there's, the, this credit unwind is being temporarily suspended by all the Fed programs that I reeled off at the beginning of this call, but not, not the regular part of the markets, not the high yield markets. There's nobody in there buying that stuff. You're going to see bankruptcies. And when you see bankruptcies, you're going to see wholesale repricing of things. And that just has a delayed, muted effect right now. Like people are living off of trying to get some of these government programs, trying to think about, you know, but it's only so long that you can have a fallen angel and then, okay, maybe it's captured in the program. So maybe it has artificially high pricing right now because it was caught in the only downgraded, you know, uh, um, in the most recent time zone. That's not, it's like, that's not sustainable. These companies have to actually make things that they sell to make a profit, to be an ongoing concern or not. And so I think, um, I think the credit markets are in for a, for a big readjustment and it's, and for sure it is all about good old fashioned stock bond and real estate pricing. Like they are not all made created equally at all. So anything you bought in a pool vehicle or in an index or like that is, this is not the time for that kind of mass beta exposure. 
I think I, I read in the earnings release yesterday that um, uh, you all took a um, 800 or $850 million uh, provision against your bridge book, but in putting that into context, I think the number that Jamie gave was that your bridge loan book was a quarter of the size of what it was heading into the great financial crisis. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I guess to some degree, to your point of there will be defaults there, but as it relates to those defaults hitting the banking sector, it's not nearly the exposure, at least from a bridge book, as it was back then. And then also you guys are just wildly better capitalized today than you were back going into the great financial crisis. Yeah, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about the banks right now. This is a very different crisis than 2008. And I also wouldn't spend time worrying about the well-run company who has been very wise about structuring their finances. They're not over their skis like they were in 2007 uh, before the great financial crisis hit. They, they have very cheap financing. They can pull down on their revolvers. The banks are there to lend to them. And the same in the consumer market. If you just go back to January when we were, headed in, when we were heading into this, you know, people don't have anywhere near the leverage that they had. Uh, the debt cost financing on a per capita basis is the lowest that it's ever been. And so not everybody has the money to withstand um, long-term uh, crises in their lives, but a lot of people are in much better shape. And then when you add to that, if there's any kind of forbearance or credit forgiveness for short periods of time, you just not get, you're not going to see the same problems in the, for lack of a better word, well capitalized parts of the consumer or the, or the, um, uh, re, you know, regular corporate markets. So um, you, you mentioned a really well-run business, and you obviously work for someone who I think is going to go down as one of the great business leaders of all time. Um, I think I, I mentioned to you that I think that you know Jack Welsh was the business leader of the 1980 to 2000 era, and while Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were in that same era as great, incredible visionary entrepreneurs, as someone who actually managed a business, I think Jack Welsh is probably the person people will look to. And over the last 20 years, I think there's plenty of a case to say that the Jeff Bezoses of the world are incredible visionaries and, and entrepreneurs, but someone like Jamie Dimon has, um, as a leader and as a manager of a business, is almost in a class unto himself. What is it, what's it like working for Jamie? And, and what makes him so special as a leader, not just kind of a year ago, but today? I mean, so let's just start with the fact that he woke up one morning a couple of weeks ago and is so in tune with his own health. He said, you know, something just doesn't feel right. And uh, he and his wife, Judy, got in a taxi cab and went to the hospital and found the tear in his heart before it actually caused any kind of a heart attack. And after a very long surgery, came out of it and has been recovering at home and working completely nonstop as if, you know, nothing had happened, which is no different than when he went through his throat cancer ish issues and he would go in for chemotherapy and then he would show up in the office, you know, a half hour later. And there, it just, there are people in life that have strength and resilience and a will to work super hard for the greater good of the, you know, quarter of a million people that work for J.P. Morgan Chase and the communities that we're in and the companies that we serve. And, like, he is the role model of that by far. This is not about him working for his sake. He's working to give everything he's got here to apply it, and especially in crisis moments. And so it just every day, his ability to run the whole ship but then just dry, deep dive, drill down into any particular issue that seems to be coming up in order to then solve the problem with the team at hand and then let it go, let them go, let them go fix it. It's just a gift that we all have. And so every day we, we, we see that. Uh, it teaches all of us how to do that same thing and then it cascades all the way down the, all the, way down the company. So everybody is a player coach. You cannot be a leader at J.P. Morgan Chase unless you can do both of those things. You can run a very efficient operation, and then you can drill down when necessary on whatever the crisis is at hand. And, you know, there's great stories about Jamie where he'll, in the old days, he used to he'd get, like, a lawn chair, and he'd set it up in the hallway of something and, like, count the number of people that came in and out of the computer room. And then when he realized that nobody actually came in to get the papers that were printed, he was, you know, able to shut it down and the 
old folk folklore stories of, you know, counting black cars, which now there aren't any. Um, he's probably counting Uber pickups or something and uh, the expenses of those. But it's just, it's just a relentless focus on attention to detail, which great leaders like Willie Walker has, is what makes a great company. And you can just see it. They just, they, they thrive on it every day and they're like, junkies for the information for the for the pulse of what's going on and they don't need to know everything that's happening at every moment it's not it's not like that it's that they want to know so that if you need their help they're there to be able to help and and piece it together and so we're really lucky i think one of the most noteworthy things as far as accomplishments that jamie's been able to do at jp morgan is that on the operating committee there are six men and there are six women uh and um you have obviously um, been an incredible leader of the asset and wealth management business at J.P. Morgan, and I and I believe that there are now more women inside of J.P. Morgan asset management than there were in the entire industry when you came into your job. What have you done to have such incredible success at both recruiting, mentoring, and creating career paths for women inside of J.P. Morgan? Uh, I would say it's a couple of things. First, any of us women at J.P. Morgan Chase are just like the women at the tops of all these other companies. You don't ever want to have gotten there because you were a woman. Because if you did, it's the whole tone of how it works in the company w won't be sustainable. So the fact that it has been so sustainable at J.P. Morgan uh, starts with somebody like Jamie Dimon. He doesn't hire people because they're a certain color skin or because they're a different race or religion. He hires them because they're really good at what they do. And that's proven out over time. Once you set the standard that that's why you're hiring diverse talent and you're putting them in their jobs, then the really good diverse talent shows up at your doorstep and wants to work at a place like that. And so you have to be able to see it and then you have to be able to replicate it all the way down, but you know, so we have uh, forty percent of our portfolio of of our assets under management are run by female portfolios. Like in the asset management industry, that's just like not a thing. And well, why is it a thing? I because I don't know. I was good money manager on the bond side, and like I met some really smart women, like Susan Bow and others who run our core equity, or Claire. Uh, Hart, who runs our, our equity income, and they're like the smartest people I've ever met. So why wouldn't they run the portfolio? It would be strange for them not to. And and putting them in that spot and then letting them run and, and then the results speak for themselves. So it's a, and you want to work at a firm that you know you're there, again, because it's results driven, not because of any other reason. No quotas, no nothing. And um, and then that's a self, once you get it to that level, it's a self-sustaining, self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, and uh, and it's a great company that that we work in because of just that. And and you can see it by the way. You you know you talked about like the different ways that we've been working in the company. Yesterday I was on an LGBTQ Zoom, and it was across the whole company. And it was just another way that we keep our business res our resource groups going in times where you you you're not doing regular way stuff. You're coming together and you're talking about those those issues and um and so we have all those different groups women on the move all those kind of things and they 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 give people the ability to get to know other people in the company that they wouldn't normally interact with and they wouldn't have a reason to know and and it's irrespective of level so you can be a brand new analyst talking to a the very experienced managing director about you know what it's like to come out of the workplace and that's like really real and genuine and 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 that those that's the heart and soul of what makes a good company and diverse company work well. So I have time for about one more question, um, which is that I think people will kill me if I don't ask you, um, not for investment advice, because I got plenty of questions ahead of time of should I be going into this or should I be going into that? And clearly not, you know, you love Tesla and you don't like Microsoft or whatever the case might be. But given the discussions going on inside of your teams as it relates to are we risk on, risk off, are we equities, are we bonds, are we um, looking for, you know, are we, are we completely out of emerging markets because the crisis is about to hit them really, really hard, uh, are we in oil, what have you, 
just yeah. generally speaking, what's the, you know, where are you all looking for opportunity right now as it relates to putting money to work? We are definitely on the prowl for all that stuff that's a just about to show its little signs of weakness. You think about all the moments in time where you wish you had, looking back, had the dry powder to be able to say, gosh, somebody had to get out of that private equity uh, holding that they had, and you have the, all of a sudden you find a secondary market for private equity. Oh my gosh, somebody you know couldn't couldn't um, buy that great piece of real estate, and so then Walker Dunlop comes in and buys it because it's a because they have the wherewithal. They've they've worked on a really uh, important fortress balance sheet. They've got it, and they're ready to they're ready to seize the opportunity. So we've been spending a lot of time uh, with all of our teams on the portfolio saying. You gotta stay invested because you wanna be here for the long term in these markets, but you have to have a port, part of that portfolio. It's there, you wait, you season it, and then you pounce on this stuff. And there's just gonna be a lot of that stuff that you're gonna wish you had had the liquidity to do. And right now feels like a really good time to make sure you've got some of that liquidity. So Mary, I just, I wanna thank you so much for joining me today on this. I know for a fact that uh, the, over 5,000 people who are listening um, will have gleaned a lot from your comments about the way that JP Morgan is managing the world we live in today and the way that you're managing the business that you run inside of JPM. Uh, I wish you and Philip and your girls um, health and uh, safety over the coming months as we uh, figure out how we're moving forward in these crisis times. And uh, I want to thank everybody on the webcast today for joining us. Um, it's a real honor for me to be able to both represent everybody at WND on these calls, and then also to be able to ask friends like Mary to join me uh, and to give these incredibly insightful perspectives on the world where we're living in today. So thank you again, Mary. Um, hope you have a great day and everybody else on the call. Have a great day and we'll see you again next week. Thanks. Such an honor. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much.